be actually changing, but we are here um, uh, to talk about an important topic. Uh, so my name is Ray Crossman. I'm president of the Adler School. Um, you folks uh, all, I think, know about what the Adler School does. Uh, we make social justice practitioners. We have an LGBTQ center here. Um, immigration is a very important issue to us. We have uh, done uh, a good deal of work in uh, this area. And so we are really thrilled to have this program uh, here at the school this morning. Um, I, um, it, it's my privilege to uh, introduce two people who don't need an introduction, so I will simply hand over the program to them. Uh, you're in good hands. Uh, Kim Hunt, you know, uh, is uh, an important activist in our community. Uh, she's been the uh, uh, executive director of Affinity, uh, I think for five years now. Almost five, yeah. Five years now. Uh, she's a consultant, she's an activist, she's a survivor of the CTA. <laughs> um, and uh, you're also in good hands with her partner, Roberto Romero Perez. Um, um, Roberto is an accomplished attorney. Um, he immigrated himself at age seven. Uh, he does a good deal of activism and uh, gives away a lot of work in this area. Um, and so between these two guys and the panel that, um, that they'll be introducing, we're in terrific hands this morning. So uh, welcome to the school. Great. Can you hear me? Do I need the microphone at all? Can you hear me fine? I excellent. Please, uh, well, please use the mic. Can you please use the mic? Can you use the mic? Is, is there with the mic? It's air handling in this room. Can be a little loud. All right. All right. How about this? Well, thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roberto Romero Perez. I'm the co-chair of the LGBT Rights Committee for Hispanic Lawyers Association of Illinois. Welcome you once again to this event. My colleague Kim Hunt and I will be moderating the panel, and so I can leave you in good hands with Kim. Okay. Um, I'm Kim. <laughs> and thank you all for coming out on a Monday morning. Just a few housekeeping details, um, lots of food, please eat. Um, the bathrooms are along the panel wall right out here to the what is that, right. And we'll make a left and then along the wall on the right. And then there is someone here taking pictures. So if you don't want your picture taken, just kind of wave and point in the other, point in the other direction or something like that. Um, I also want to point out that Roberto and I and our organizations are part of the LGBTQ Immigrant Rights Coalition of Chicago. And it's a coalition that's been around about four years in this iteration. I think there was a coalition before. And the coalition is made up of individuals and organizations that work on LGBT and immigration issues. And uh, so this is one of many panels and programs that the coalition does each year. And now I am going to take you through a nearly 50-year history of uh, immigration law as it impacts LGBTQ people. And it won't take long, I promise. So starting in 65, we have uh, the U.S. immigration laws amended the 1965 uh, law to exclude homosexuals. In 87, we have the first iteration of the HIV ban. Uh, where Congress bans people who are HIV positive from entering the U.S., uh, except under very strict circumstances where they can apply for a waiver. In 1990, the ban disappears. Um, there, at that time, there's also a case with the Board of Immigration Appeals that recognized the need to protect homosexuals as a social group. In 93, the HIV ban becomes law and is law for the next 20 years. In 1994, there is the uh, Tobaso Alfonso uh, president, and their uh, U.S. Attorney Janet Reno releases an order that states that an individual who has been identified as homosexual and persecuted by his or her government for that reason alone may be eligible for relief under the refugee laws on the basis of prosecution because of membership in a social group. Uh, two years later, DOMA is signed into law. And there's good news on the other end of that. Then in 2000, we have the Permanent Partners Immigration Act. And this introduced, is introduced on Valentine's Day. The legislation would allow U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents 
to sponsor their, their same-sex partners for immigration to the U.S. by simply adding the term permanent partner in sections where spouse appears in the Immigration Act. Also that year is an asylum case called uh, Hernandez Montiel, uh, where the U.S. Court of Appeals holds that the petitioner, a gay man with a female sexual identity, who may be considered transsexual, is entitled to asylum and withholding of deportation. In 2003, um, the Department of Homeland Security issues a new policy regarding marriages with one transsexual spouse that invalidates all legal marriages between two persons born of the same sex. A year later, the Bush government issues a new policy regarding marriages with a transsexual spouse. The policy now invalidates all legal marriages between two individuals where one or both parties claims to be a transsexual. And this is the term that they use in the law. In 2005, the Board of Immigration Appeals issues an interim decision um, in which it upholds the validity of a marriage, a legal marriage, with a transsexual spouse and approves the green card. Um, the, in that same year, the Permanent Partners Immigration Act is reintroduced to the House and Senate under its new name that many of us know it by as the United American Families Act. In 2007, Another asylum case, uh, immigration judge denies um, the plaintiff in this case uh, asylum because Vega is the name of the person, does not appear gay to him. <laughs> <laughs> the decision is appealed and asylum is secured with the help of Lambda Legal. In 2007, the HIV ban is um, eliminated, it's lifted. In 2011, we're almost home, <laughs> we have this term prosecutorial discretion and the Department of Justice announced that it would no longer defend the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. And in August of that year, DHS made it clear that one of the favorable factors in exercising prosecutorial discretion in family ties would include LGBT families. Last year, in January, uh, the U.S. Citizen, Citizenship and Immigration Services released guidance for adjudicating lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex refugee and asylum claims. In April, they issued a policy memorandum updating its guidance on the adjudication of marriage-based petitions and gender correction on identity documents for transgender people. And then in October of last year, DHS issues uh, written guidance clarifying that LGBT families are included in its definition of families for purposes of exercising discretion. And then in June of this year, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. Uh, Thank you, Kim. And actually, this whole history is just to show you that this didn't really occur in a vacuum. You know, there's a precedent and there's a whole bunch of series of case law that you know, precedes U.S. v. Windsor, and it is actually within this context that Esther Baruja entered the U.S. with her U.S. citizen partner, so she's going to give us a testimonial of her history and how she arrived to the U.S. Good morning. Good morning. So, my name is Esther. I'm from Paraguay, South America. I got here three years and a half ago. Um, but uh, I, I want to let you know how, how that happened. So uh, in 2004, I met a missionary, a Christian missionary in Chile that was working in the same ministry uh, that I was working uh, to. Um, because we were in a conservative uh, environment, Christian environment. Uh, homosexuality was considered, it is considered a sin. So for us, uh, the first obstacle was to overcome uh, religious prejudices to be together. So, long story short, finally in 2006 we decided to be together. She wanted to bring me to the United States. She is an, she's from Ohio, uh, but she was living in Chile at that time. She wanted to bring me here. And that was the first time she noticed that this doma existed. Um, it was impossible for me to get any kind of visa other than tourist visa to be here, like to visit friends or families. Um, worker, work, 
work visa was impossible. I didn't have anyone to hire me here just because uh, the, uh, that to, to get a work visa, uh, for at least the, the way that we understood was that the, the job really needs to prove that you are the only one who can do that and they can't find anyone else in the United States to do that. So it was kind of like very, very difficult. Uh, also to get like a business visa, you need a one, one million dollars. So it's like no way. So we get we get to the point to have to choose a third third country. So we went to Argentina. We live in Argentina for three years. Immigration there is very easy. It's very it was very uh, the the system there is just so nice and welcoming. Um, right now, um, uh, Argentina has the most advanced uh, gender identity law. They have same-sex marriage. They have um, the the government pays for 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 uh, reproductive uh, uh, rights for everybody. So it's like it's an amazing country for many many reasons. But it wasn't our choice to be there. Kate is an American citizen. She had she paid taxes every year, uh, but she didn't have the right to pay. Me. She she was very depressed and those years there, she was in a point, uh, she felt like so, she felt so second class, third class, fourth class. She felt that the country didn't love her, they rejected her. Plus our religious community already rejected her um, and rejected me too. Some of our families also reject her, rejected us already, friends. And then also the country. <laughs> the country doesn't want you. Um, so I tried to the, to get the diversity lottery visa since 2006. I apply every year. I never thought that it was going to work because it's a lottery online and you know that things don't exist. But she wanted me to to do it every year. So finally, in 2009, I won the possibility to apply. It's not they, they don't hand it to you the visa. You apply for the visa. So you have to show so many things. They ask me for vaccination things that I did when I was one year old. So it's really, really complicated and it's expensive. Um, at least for us, it costs almost $2,000 living in, in Argentina. and. And, and having the, the, the you earning the money that you have in, in another country that's not the states, two thousand dollars is a lot for whole the whole process. But because what you pay for the inter, uh, interviews a a ninety nine, I think that at that time two thousand nine two thousand ten. But it was very difficult in general to get through the process. It's not very easy. So even though the web page says that they give you fifty. The, the, the government gives 50,000 visas every year. They don't say how many of them are approved. So, but in my, in my case, now that I know the immigration system in the United States, I know that that was super easy and cheap. I didn't know how, how difficult it is to become a citizen now, even with the immigration reform, it's gonna take like 15 years. So for me it was, I got the, the notification in July 2009, and in February 2010, I was granted the, the visa, the resident, the green card, and I, we came here in March. So during the process, I never put my partner's name in, in my papers, never. She's not, she doesn't exist in my papers, because legally she didn't. She. She's not, she wasn't living here, so she couldn't be my affidavit. So I, we find friends that sign for me, uh, but she couldn't say that she, uh, she's going to live with, in my parents' house. She couldn't say, I'm gonna help her to, to uh, acclimate, uh, to assimilate the culture or whatever. She, she never ever, um, uh, she's not, she doesn't exist in my papers. The way that I come here is alone. No family, no friends. So that uh, now, every time I, I think about it, it's just so dehumanizing. 
because I was with my partner already for many, many years, but the country doesn't respect, doesn't accept, doesn't recognize my, 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 my relationship. So we, we, I did the, the interview and I remember that uh, it's, even though you know the, the system say, they say that it's very uh, objective, it depends a lot about how you interconnect with the person and it happens that the person was a Christian and I, after I went to, to, to Argentina, I started seminary there because there are more progressive uh, uh, congregations uh, in Argentina. So I was still pursuing my, my, uh, uh, my dream to becoming a pastor that I had before in, in Paraguay because in Argentina it was possible. So we interconnect with the religious part, but I didn't say that I was a, Christ I was a lesbian. And uh, so I think that helped me a lot to, to get the visa too. You know, we went near the same people and etc. So it's like, it's always hiding. I always feel like it's a lot of hiding and no lying in my case, but it's just not saying entirely who I am. It's all, the system for me always put me in, this, in the position that I have to be divided. My whole being is not accepted. It's just one part, okay, the immigrant part. Right now in Chicago, I'm, I'm in Chicago's Theological Seminary and, and also in the process to becoming a pastor with the UCC, a very progressive church. And I was working with the Immigration Coalition of Churches. And uh, last May, we were all talking about immigration reform. Doma was still there. And the, 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 the LGBT couples that be national same-sex couple were, was in, were in the same situation. American can sponsor their partners that are from another country. So I tried that our coalition um, support WAFA that was a United American, um, United, United American Family Act to, to let the national couple uh, come together here and those congregations that are so progress, progressive said we can mix this because in, in, uh, immigrants are homophobic, Latino uh, and conservative people, and they they, they won't want to uh, do this. Uh, so that's why I knew that even though in progressive environments, it was it was still difficult for me to be my whole thing, my whole being. That, that is my experience, um, uh, very short way to say, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esther. So as you heard, Esther met an American citizen, a U.S. citizen, when she was doing her missionary work in, in South America. Her partner was not able to petition for her to enter the U.S. But the story changes right now as a result of USB Windsor. You know, her story was different, very different from what we can do right now. Now, how many of you are not familiar with the USB Windsor decision? I assume, okay, for those of you who are not, I'm just going to give a really brief uh, synopsis of what USB Windsor is about. The bottom line in USB Windsor is that the Supreme Court issued a decision declaring that Section 3 of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, was really declared unconstitutional. And the main reason why they did it is basically the court held that restricting the federal interpretation of the words of the terms marriage and spouse when applied only to same, to opposite sex unions was unconstitutional. That's really what the crux of the matter in USB Windsor. And who cares about the taxation issues that came behind it? The real matter in USB Windsor is the terms marriage and spouse, when applying federal terms to only opposite sex couples, is unconstitutional and limited under the due process clause of the US Constitution. That in itself, you know, that became an opening door for a lot of things. It really unbundled, that, that really effectively allowed married couples who are the same sex a bundle of rights and benefits that were only at the moment available to opposite sex couples. 
So there are about 1,100 benefits and rights that are bundled with the term marriage and unspouse that are now available to same-sex couples, all right, including those in the area of immigration. And that's why we're really here today. We're here to talk about what those bundle of rights are and those benefits that now same-sex couples in the area of immigration are really eligible for, okay? And so that's why we're here, and we have a great panel of people, and I'll be happy to introduce you to them. We have Vanessa Esparza Lopez, who is a supervising attorney for the Immigrant Legal Defense Project at the National Immigrant Justice Center. We also have on the other side Andres Sarritos, he is an immigration attorney and principal at the Andres Sarritos Law Office, which is a law firm that specializes exclusively in the area of immigration. We have Solomon Myers who is a partner in the law firm of Myers & Myers in Chicago and has engaged almost exclusively in the practice of various aspects of immigration law. We also have with us Angela Padragas, who is a licensed psychotherapist specializing in immigration and bicultural issues. She is the director of comprehensive services at the Near North Health Service Corporation. There, she maintains communications with the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of Refugee Settlement. And last but not least, we have Dr. Elena Quintana, who is the Executive Director of the Institute of Public and Safety and Social Justice at the Adler School of Professional Psychology, who is our sponsor this morning. She has served as a consultant for the World Health Organization on immigration and mental health issues. So now we can begin our discussion and our panel. So our first question to our panelists, and I thank you very much for you all for making it this morning. And Vanessa, let's begin talking about the legal aspect of USB Windsor. Now that Section 3 of DOMA has been found unconstitutional, can a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident sponsor his or her same-sex spouse for immigration benefits? So the short answer is yes, but really that's the beginning, thank you, of the inquiry. Because immigrating a spouse it's really, immigration law is very nuanced and riddled with obstacles and difficulties that a person confronts. So I really appreciate Estelle sharing her story with us. And although the repeal of Section 3 of DOMA will make it easier for financial same-sex couples to be together, there's still obstacles that they're gonna face. In essence, when, and I'm gonna use the term foreign national, and non-citizen when referring to a person that wants to immigrate to the United States, okay? And U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident will apply to the spouse who wants to bring their family member to the United States. In essence, when a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident wants to bring their loved one to the United States, it's a two-step process. Some couples can complete those two steps at the same time while others cannot, okay? The first step is filing what's called a Form I-130, which is the family visa petition, okay? And this is basically a form that's filed with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, to show or to prove to the government that you have a legal relationship based upon which the foreign national can then seek the green card, lawful permanent residence. So what the repeal of Section 3 of DOMA really helps with is this first step. Because now, same-sex marriages are viewed as lawful under federal laws, right? But that's just the first step. The second step is actually seeking the green card. And that can bring a whole host of other issues into play. Once the I-130 or that family visa petition is approved, then you have to look at um, whether the foreign national is eligible to apply for their green card, also how long will it take for them to get their green card, and where can they complete the process? Can the process be completed within the United States, or does the foreign national have to return to his or her home country? So the two basic routes to get your green card are if you're eligible to apply within the United States, it's called adjustment of status. If the individual is not allowed to apply within the United States, it's, the route is called consular processing. The route that the individual must take really depends on a whole host of factors. 
is the petitioner, is the person seeking to bring their spouse to the United States a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident? Did the foreign national enter the United States lawfully or illegally? Does the foreign national have a criminal background or criminal convictions? Um, does the foreign national have other immigration violations on their record? All of these things factor into whether the individual can apply within the United States or outside of the United States. The people that are eligible to apply within the United States, and there's all, always exceptions to this basic rule, but the, basically the people who are eligible to apply within the United States are immediate relatives of U.S. citizens who have been inspected or admitted into the United States. So let me break that down. An immediate relative under immigration laws is considered to be a spouse, a parent, or an unmarried child under 21 of a U.S. citizen. That's an immediate relative. And that immediate relative has to have been inspected and admitted into the United States, which means that they had to have, for example, entered on some sort of visa, be it a tourist visa, a work visa, student visa, etc. So those individuals are really in the best situation possible because they are they can file for those two steps at the same time. They can file the family petition and the application for the green card concurrently, and they can apply within the United States without having to go back to their home country. That's the ideal situation, but not all binational couples feel, fit this situation. If your foreign national spouse entered the United States illegally, it doesn't matter if you're married to a U.S. citizen. If you enter it illegally, you're going to have to go back home to your home country and consular process. Or, for example, spouses of permanent residents um, will likely have to return to their home country. Now, this brings up a specific set of concerns for binational same-sex couples because it really, for some foreign nationals, it's really a matter of concern for their safety if they have to return to their home country, right? Uh, a lot of foreign countries not only criminally penalize uh, homosexuality, but they also persecute individuals on the basis of their sexual orientation. So if the individual has, it's a real concern whether, yes, the U.S. citizen spouse or permanent resident spouse can file that family petition, but they really have to think long term through the entire process whether it's beneficial to go through consular processing, right? Um, because, like I said, there's there's real dangers, real concerns that the person can face in returning to their home country. One option that's possible with consular processing is to ask the Department of State, which is the agency that deals with consular processing, if the foreign national can process in a third country. So not, the, not their home country, but in a third country. And that can be requested, for example, if the foreign national is homeless, or if the foreign national is legally and physically present in a consular district in another country, um, or if exceptional circumstances are existing in the case. And th so that would be the branch under which you could request third country processing. So let me interject here. If I am a citizen from Uganda or from Russia or Jamaica and I want to seek consular processing, those are the, the three conditions that I must meet. Is that what it is? Right. You don't have, it's, it's or, right? Okay. You don't have to meet all three. Um, so I think exactly if, if your foreign national spouse is from any of those countries, you're going to want to reach out to the Department of State ahead of time and see if it's possible to do third country processing for your spouse. Um, because they could face persecution, jail time, etc. if they do go through that route. Other factors that have to be considered um, when consular processing is involved is if the foreign national has accumulated what's called unlawful presence in the United States. So this is if, if someone enters illegally and they've been here for more than six months um, or more than a year. Um, or if you entered on a tourist visa but you overstayed that tourist visa for a certain period of time, consular processing requires you to leave the United States to finish the process. 
Well, at the moment, you step foot outside of the United States. Because you have accumulated unlawful presence, you're going to trigger a bar to your return. That bar can either be three years or ten years. So there are waivers available, and I think we're going to talk about waivers a little bit um, later on in more detail. But so that's going to require, that's another hurdle that you have to overcome. You have to then convince immigration that your spouse in the United States would suffer extreme hardship if USCIS doesn't kind of forgive those three or ten year bars and allow you to return more quickly to the United States. I, we're going to be talking about those a little later. But you talk about couples who are already married. What about couples who are not married yet? What should they do? Right, so for couples who are not married, then you should look into the potential of a fiancé visa. Okay, so the fiancé visa, if your spouse is living abroad, um, you file the fiancé visa through the Department of State, and you have to prove to immigration that you've met within the past two years of you requesting the fiancé visa um, for your fiancé. You have to prove that you are going to be married in a jurisdiction that allows same-sex marriages if you don't already live in a jurisdiction that allows same-sex marriages. And if the fiancé visa is approved, once the fiancé enters the United States with that visa, the couple must marry within the 90-day period. Okay, if the couple does not marry within the 90-day period, then the foreign national must return to his or her home country or be subject to removal proceedings. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, now, let's talk about removal, because there are a lot of uh, foreign citizens in the U.S. who are in the process of removal, and we have Andres Cerritos, who is an expert in removal. And I guess the question for Andres is, now that we know what the court have done, how does the ruling affect those persons who are currently in removal proceedings? Well, if a person's in removal proceedings now, uh, I guess the first recommendation, the first thing they can do is apply. They can now apply for certain forms of relief uh, that were previously unavailable to them. Uh, to give you an example, there's something called cancellation of removal, and uh, one of the requirements for that is to have a qualifying relative. And a qualifying relative can be a U.S. citizen uh, or legal permanent resident, son or daughter. Uh, it could be a mother or father, um, or a spouse. And in this case, if you now have a spouse, uh, you can apply for um, that type of relief. Uh, and you can also apply for every other form of relief that you would have. Uh, available to you in those proceedings too. So another thing would be adjustment of status, uh, as Vanessa was just mentioning. Um, and in that case, if you're eligible for that, you can seek that relief before an immigration judge as well. Uh, so now it opens up the possibilities, it opens up the options that a person has uh, in removal proceedings that were not previously available to them in, uh, in some cases. Uh, and it also opens up the possibility of applying for something called VAWA. Uh, where uh, you'd have to show that, for example, that, a, that you suffered extreme cruelty on, the, on, on account of uh, the abuse from a, from a U.S. citizen spouse or legal permanent resident spouse. Uh, so in all those cases, now suddenly people have options to, to fight their case, uh, whereas uh, before they simply just didn't have that option and had to uh, take the, you know, the least desirable route, maybe asking for something uh, like voluntary departure or maybe even being removed um, because they didn't uh, merit that that uh, uh, that um, decision. Uh, but these cases all happen, I mean, a case, some people may have a case that's pending and they may be able to apply for something now affirmatively, but if the, per if the case has already been uh, ruled on, if a removal order already exists, uh, and a person is now filing an appeal, and their case is currently on appeal, then they have other options as well. They can file a motion to remand uh, back to the immigration judge so that they, the person can seek uh, these forms of relief that I previously described, uh, and, and or they can seek a motion to reopen. You know, deciding whether or not to seek a motion to remand or a motion to reopen is, um, is something I don't want to get into here, uh, but there's a strategy with both. Uh, and typically, if you seek a motion to remand before the BIA, the Board of Immigration Appeals rules, makes their ruling, uh, then you can preserve a motion to reopen later on. And so that's an example of how you would use that. Um, but then in another case, uh, you know, another stage would be people who have cases that have been administratively closed. Uh, 
Um, so if a person has a case that's been administratively closed, that essentially means that the case is still pending before the immigration court, but uh, the case has been closed. It's no longer on the docket. No one's moving forward with the case. And there, someone should take into account whether or not it's in their best interest to reopen that case or not, uh, or to recalendar that case and fight and submit the, the forms of relief that were previously, that are now available to them. Now, I remember Kim mentioned prosecutorial discretion during the summary that she was making of the LGBT immigration history. But what kinds of prosecutorial discretion requests can be made to the department? I think those are made to the Department of Homeland Security, right? Yeah. What, what kind of requests can be made on behalf of an LGBT person who is already in removal proceedings? Well, prosecutorial discretion is, you know, it's the decision that a person um, you know, an officer, a supervisor, an agent, an attorney that works for, for ICE, it's a decision that they make whether or not to enforce the law against any individual. Uh, so it's, it's a decision that they must make. It's not something that a non-citizen can affirmatively apply for by meeting a certain set of criteria and saying, I am eligible for this, therefore you should give me prosecutorial discretion, for example. Uh, it happens in the opposite. It's where you're asking, but all the power rests with the Department of Homeland Security. Whether or not they decide to exercise prosecutorial discretion is something that they uh, themselves uh, decide. Uh, but the decisions that, you know, it, it is significant in the sense that if granted, uh, a case can be closed. It can be administratively closed. And although that doesn't mean that a person gains some type of legal status, it does mean that a person is no longer actively trying to be removed by, uh, by the Department of Homeland Security or by ICE. Uh, and so the request can be, uh, it can be that, to administratively close the case. It can be to, uh, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, ICE agents, supervisors, lawyers, they can take it upon themselves also to not even start a case in the first place when they come across a person. Uh, or once a case is already before an immigration judge, uh, one of the attorneys for, for the Office of uh, Legal Counsel, they can, um, uh, you know, join in a motion to administratively close the case if there's favorable equities. And here, I think, is the, the, the tough part about prosecutorial discretion, is that there is a laundry list of, of items that, uh, that ICE weighs, right? They weigh everything from how long have you been inside the country, what are your family ties, do you have any serious criminal convictions, have you... Uh, been involved in any gang, uh, been involved in a gang, part of a gang, have you, I mean, there is so many things, or have you, are you, uh, have you been a victim in a crime, are you currently helping a person, I mean, the police investigate that crime, uh, did you come to the United States before you were 16 years old, uh, do you have family members with serious medical conditions, uh, uh, family relationships now encompass uh, same-sex uh, uh, relationships, um, so, you know, do you have family ties, and do, do those family now that those family relationships encompass same-sex relationships, um, that's one of the factors. But my point is that there are so many lists, so many items, and they are not numbered. They are not somehow weighed in any order. Uh, so ICE gets to decide what it is that they weigh, uh, what is it that they deem significant, important, what is it that's favorable enough uh, in order to get a grant of this. So, uh, in my experience, it's been something that's uh, hard to accomplish uh, because if a person's in removal proceedings in the first place, somebody has already made the determination to move forward with this case. Uh, so someone has already looked at those favorable equities. Uh, at least that's the assumption. Uh, and, they, and those equities aside, they've decided to move forward with, uh, uh, with removal proceedings against the person. So when you're asking for prosecutorial discretion, um, you're asking them to review it again in most cases, uh, once a case is already before an immigration judge. And uh, in my experience, that's a, it's a tough um, thing to obtain, but not impossible. Um, so I, at the same time, we have been able to do it for some clients. And what it essentially does is uh, it closes the case after ICE has weighed the favorable equities in the case. Great. Thank you, Andres. And that really is when you're really already married. You know, the next question is, 
what happens, you know, where can I get married? And I hear this term constantly of the celebration rule. So the question to Solomon is, uh, what is the celebration rule and what is the historical background on celebration rule on immigration? I mean, how would it apply to a same-sex couple? Well, the celebration rule basically is uh, one way of determining if a marriage is going to be considered legal uh, by the immigration service for purposes of the immigration law. If it's not considered legal, you can't sponsor your spouse. So the celebration rule basically says if the marriage was legal in the place where it was celebrated, then it should be recognized as legal and binding and the immigration service should accept it as creating a legal marriage and allowing that U.S. citizen or permanent resident spouse to sponsor their partner, who's now their spouse. Uh, the problem with the celebration rule is that we haven't always in the past looked only to the law of the place where the marriage was celebrated to determine whether the marriage is legal. Frequently, the Immigration Service in the past with other issues has looked also to the law of the place of the domicile of the U.S. citizen or permanent resident or of the couple. So basically we have three potential categories of same-sex marriage now that DOMA has been struck down. One is a couple that lives in a state that recognizes same-sex marriage and gets married in a state that recognizes same-sex marriage. Um, clearly the marriage is legal in the place where it's celebrated and legal in the place where they live. Now under the Windsor case, it is highly likely that that person is going to be able to sponsor their foreign spouse. The second category is a couple that lives in a state where same-sex marriage is legal. They get married in a state where same-sex marriage is legal, but let's say they then move to a different state where same-sex marriage is not recognized. So it was legal when they were married there, they were living in that state, now all of a sudden they move to Florida or Illinois or Texas. Is the immigration service going to recognize that? If we're following the celebration rule, they should, because it was legal in the place where it was celebrated. Uh, the hard part of this is the third category, and this is what's most relevant here in Illinois, at least at this time, until we have same-sex marriage in Illinois. And that is, what if you and your foreign spouse or partner live in a state like Illinois that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage, you go out of the state of Illinois, let's say to Iowa or Minnesota where same-sex marriage is recognized, you get married, you come back to Illinois, and now you want to sponsor your spouse for immigration. Will the immigration service recognize that marriage in that case? Illinois has passed two parts of a law called the Uniform Evasion of Marriage Act. And basically what that law says is if you're an Illinois resident and you go out of Illinois to get married and you enter into a marriage outside of Illinois, which although legal in the place where you got married, would not be able to be done in Illinois because it's not recognized. And then you come back to Illinois to live, Illinois doesn't recognize that marriage. The converse of that is if a couple uh, were to get married in Illinois, but the marriage they enter into in Illinois wouldn't be allowed in their home state, then Illinois won't recognize the marriage, even if Illinois residents could have done it in Illinois. So we have a situation now where we don't know if an Illinois couple goes outside of Illinois to get married, will the Immigration Service recognize that marriage for purposes of immigration law? The Windsor case was good in a sense because it said hey, marriage has always been decided by the states. The federal government wasn't recognizing that with, re with respect to same-sex marriage. There's no constitutional basis for making a distinction. We're going to put it back to the states. What a Pandora's box, because now we don't know. We have some states that allow same-sex marriage. We have other states that don't. Um, in immigration, historically, uh, the Immigration Service has always looked to the place of celebration to determine if the marriage is legal. That sounds great. People from Illinois can go to Iowa or Minnesota, get married, come back to Illinois, and even though Illinois doesn't recognize it, immigration should recognize it. Maybe. Um, the other contexts in which the celebration rule has arisen are where a couple has gotten married in a state and 
one of the partners or spouses had previously been divorced in a different state. And there was a question as to whether or not the state where they got married would recognize the divorce from a previous state or from a foreign country. And that's where the celebration rule came about. And there were several court cases before the Board of Immigration Appeals where they said, hey, California would recognize the divorce that happened in Mexico. And so because California recognized it and allowed the couple to get married in California, the marriage is valid in the place of celebration, and we will recognize that marriage. So that's, that's how the celebration rule basically came about. It's also been applied in the past in another context. Um, in the United States and throughout the world, some places allow marriage between first cousins, and some places don't. Uh, Illinois actually allows marriage between first cousins in certain cases, but not all the time. Before the Windsor case, it was pretty well known in immigration law that if two first cousins got married in a place where the marriage was legal, but they were going to be living in a state in the United States that wouldn't recognize that marriage, even though it was valid in the place where the marriage was celebrated, the immigration service would not recognize the visa. Usually they didn't know because the form doesn't ask you if you're a first cousin to your spouse. But the consulates and embassies who were doing the immigrant visa interviews, they knew about this. They knew in those countries where it was legal that it was also common. And they would do their research and they would find out. New York allows marriage between first cousins. If the couple got married in, let's say, Pakistan, where marriage between first cousins is legal, and they were going to go live in New York, the embassy in Islamabad would give them a visa. If they were going to come live in Illinois, and they weren't over 55 or permanently incapable of having children, such that the same sex or the first cousin marriage wouldn't be recognized in Illinois, they were denied a visa. So that's but you can always be a resident of one state, and after you get your visa and everything is ready, you can just move to another one, right? You can, but you have to show that before you get the visa, and the embassy has to believe you, and they have full discretion. So in the past, immigration has looked at the issue of where does the U.S. citizen and permanent resident live, where has he lived, and what does the law of that state say uh, with regard to recognizing the marriage. So the celebration rule is great to the extent that it will be enforced strictly. The question that we have open going forward is, how are the immigration service, the US Citizenship and Immigration Service, which decides the I-130 visa petitions that Vanessa was talking about, how are they going to interpret this? How is the US State Department runs all the consulates and embassies and does those immigrant interviews outside the United States, how are they going to interpret it? And that's, that's where we stand right now. And that brings me to 